Oh, hello everyone, I'm Benito, if you didn't know, and welcome to my YouTube channel. Now, if you've been following my Instagram, at Benito Explains recently, you will know that I've recently been in Mexico looking for all sorts of interesting wildlife. If you haven't been on my Instagram, well, never fear, because if you go to my profile, you'll be able to see all those Mexico highlights right now. If you can't be bothered to do that, also don't worry, because I'm putting together a couple of YouTube videos which will cover all the exciting moments of the trip. And I'll edit that within the next, I don't know, I actually don't know, next month or so. But for the moment, I thought I'd do a slightly different video. The new academic year is starting. This time last year, I was starting to think about applying for PhDs, and thankfully, <laughs> I got one! Um, so in a week's time, as of the date of recording, I'm about to start um, a PhD at the University of Bristol in biology, studying the brains of butterflies. It's a fully funded PhD um, by NERC, the Natural Environment Research Council. Um, and a year ago, when I was just starting to think about this, I really didn't have much of a clue about, you know, how to apply for a PhD, how the whole process works. And the truth is, it is very complicated and there aren't that many videos on YouTube explaining the process. So I thought I'd make a change to that. And also for those, you know, all those fans that I have out there that um, have been there since day one, it's also going to be a bit of a throwback because the old whiteboard is back, everyone. Now, before I go any further, I'd like to say that my area of expertise is really only in PhDs in biology. I think the system is pretty similar for PhDs in any science. But really, don't quote me on that. There could be different systems if you're applying for a PhD in, in physics or whatever. But the PhD in biology, however, I think I'm pretty experienced with because I'll be honest with you, not to scare you straight from the start, but it was a good few months of hell. Nevertheless, I've somehow come up with seven top tips to increase your chances of getting a PhD mainly in biology in the UK. So without further ado, so, you know, I don't spend ages editing this thing and, you know, you, you lot don't fall asleep. I'm also extremely jet lagged, by the way. I've just come from Mexico, remember? Um, let's just get on with it. Right, step one, think about your interests. Now that seems like a pretty obvious point, doesn't it? Now when I was doing my undergraduate degree, especially at the end of second year, I didn't really have much of a clue of what I wanted to specialise in. I was interested in most of my modules, so it was really hard for me to pin down um, what I liked. So it's definitely not a, an easy thing to do, and it does require some time. At the end of my third year, I had a bit of a better idea, and that's what led me to do a Master's by Research. Now, a Master's by Research is like a mini PhD, basically. I ended up really enjoying it, and that's what eventually convinced me to um, want to do a PhD. So if you want to get an idea of what research is really like, then the Masters by Research really is great because, as I say, it's like a mini PhD. However, a Masters by Research isn't for everyone. You know, it is a, a year, sometimes up to two years of your life, you know, thinking about just one question. So really, really think about doing a Masters by Research in a similar way to how you do a PhD. You know, don't just do it because you're you know, you, you're, you get to work with cute fluffy animals or whatever. You know, a lot of the time, the animals you're working with aren't necessarily what you're interested in, they're just providing a model to answer something a lot broader. So just to give you an example, in my university, the University of Bristol, there is a, a research group which does a lot of fascinating research on dwarf mongooses in South Africa, which obviously sounds lovely and lots of amazing research has come up out of it. But I can imagine to an undergraduate who likes cute fluffy animals, it sounds quite appealing because of the cute fluffy animals rather than the research question in general, which is kind of like, you know, the effect of anthropogenic noise on animals or, you know, the evolution of sociality. So make sure you're interested in the, in the broad research question rather than the study organism. But, of course, if you want to go into something more specialised, then there are taught master's courses out there as well, and that's perfectly fine. Normally, as I'll get onto later, these PhDs are very competitive, so having a master's 
anyway is a good idea. Even if you're, you know, extremely sure that you want to do a PhD straight after your undergrad, it's often a good idea to apply for a master's as well because that'll kind of put you up further up the hierarchy, you know what I'm saying. Also in terms of competitiveness, and I realise that this may sound a bit intimidating to some people, if you're an undergrad, seriously try and get a first in your undergraduate degree. Uh, <laughs> I know that may seem a bit daunting, but um, you have no idea how much it will help you later on. You know, it really does take you up another level in the application process. And as I say, they're extremely competitive. Right, step two, what have we got here? Email academics, including your CV. Well, that's something which I started doing around now, actually. So whilst I was doing my Masters by Research, you know, when I was referencing people, I started to find, you know, see that names popped up a lot. And after going to several conferences, um, it, became, it became clear who the, who the bigwigs were in your field. So what I did was I developed a, a hit list, which sounds kind of weird, but I mean, that, that is what it was, of people I wanted to contact. And I sent them a long, well, long-ish email saying, oh, you know, I love your work. I've read this and this and that. I love that. I love these ideas. Um, are there any PhD opportunities? So really just kind of selling myself. And I also included my CV in there as well. Um, and I think all of them replied. Um, but at that point in my life, I didn't still really understand how the PhD application process worked. Um, so I didn't really know what I was doing it for, really. Was someone going to offer me a PhD, you know, straight off that email? Well, of course they wouldn't. Uh, um, but it was still a good thing because what well, showed that I was keen for a start, which may, you know, have affected their decision later on down the line. And also, it meant that they could notify me if they were advertising a PhD later on in the year. So it was all a, all a good thing and it meant I didn't miss anything. So I'd really encourage you to do that as well. But yes, my third point is check findaphd.com in October slash November. In late October and early November, that's when things really start to get cooking. So find a PhD is basically a search engine for PhDs. You type in keywords and any relevant projects with those keywords in them will show up. So it's quite easy to use and that's how I found all the PhDs that I eventually applied for. So the results that you see on find a PhD are just the names of projects. Right, potential projects led, um, supervised by a lead academic. But unfortunately, it's not as simple as that because, especially at the end of October and early November, most of those projects in the UK are going to be part of something called a DTP. And this is where the confusion starts, you see. Now, a DTP stands for Doctoral Training partnership. And essentially what it is, is it's a type of cohort-based training um, funded by a specific funding body. Now, if you're doing a PhD in biology, the main funders, the main funding bodies that I'm aware of are either BBSRC or NERC. And each of those have their own doctoral training partnership. Another quirk of it is that it's regional. So my PhD, which I'm starting in September, is funded by NERC. And to be more specific, it's called the NERC GW4 DTP. And that GW4 means it doesn't just include the University of Bristol, but also the universities of Cardiff, Bath and Exeter as well. And this is happening all over the country. So NERC have other DTPs with other um, regional universities. So I apply for one in York and that DTP also include the universities of Sheffield and Liverpool as well. So they're all kind of grouped together across the country. Each DTP takes on a certain number of students per year that are all funded by the same funding body and all those students receive all the same training. 
Oh god, sorry, I almost burped on camera. So once you've found some PhDs that you're interested in, then you can move on to step four. Familiarise yourself with a DTP application process. And to be honest with you, if it doesn't make you shiver, then whew, you've got nerves of steel. So I'm going to explain briefly what happens in every DTP application process, right? So an academic puts forward um, a project um, to be potentially funded by this DTP if they get the perfect student. Okay. The deadline for these DTPs are normally in December or January, but make sure you double check with your DTP because everyone has a slightly different deadline. But anyway, so then you apply to that project, right? And then the lead academic will sort through all the applications and then they will choose just one applicant, the best applicant. Also, by the way, before you apply, it's normally also a good idea to email the academic and say that you're applying or ask whether you can arrange a Skype conversation or something like that, because that shows that you're interested. But anyway, then a month goes by and then you hear back. So if you are the best applicant, congratulations, you've got through to the second round of this really weirdly contrived PhD game show. But before I go into the next step, that brings me on to step five. I'm really neglecting this whiteboard, actually. I just, I just wanted to go back to old times, you know? But anyway, step five was apply to loads. Apply to loads of projects, okay? Anything which fits your interests. Obviously don't apply to anything which you're not interested in, but anything that you're vaguely interested in, even if you think you're not massively qualified, for it as well. Anything which you think you could invest three to four years of your life in, <laughs> just go for it, right? It'll be a lot of writing um, of cover letters, but normally, you know, you can just tweak things from other cover letters, but, you know, still make it personal. The academics will probably know this as well, you know, you've got to play the game in this situation, they'll know that you're applying to different projects, and if you tell them, they shouldn't be offended by that at all, because, as I say, it's difficult, so you've got to play the game. My sixth point is prepare well for any interviews. Also quite obvious, isn't it? That's a pretty obvious thing to say, Benito. As I was saying, if you do get selected, that's when things start to get a little bit more complicated, I'm afraid. <laughs> because now, every academic that has proposed a particular project for that DTP selects their best applicant, and that best applicant then competes against everyone else's best applicants, right? And then there's a selection committee which filters those down even more. This is before, you know, a formal interview now, right? So this is just judging by, um, you know, your application and how the your um, prospective supervisor has sold you, basically. A subsection of those applicants are invited to interview. Now, what's this interview for? Well, this is the interview for the funding. So remember at this point, you have technically got the PhD, but you haven't got the funding yet. I mean, I personally don't see how it's possible to do a PhD, you know, four years of your life, um, self-funding yourself. Unless you're Brooklyn Beckham, maybe. But I don't think he's going to do a PhD, is he? And this is the really formal interview. As I was saying, the interviews which you had previously with your prospective supervisor tend to be a little bit more laid back. Um, but the ones for the funding body are um, pretty uh, pretty daunting, actually. And for me, I found them especially daunting because I don't think I'd actually had any proper, well, any good interview experience before then. So I was nervous, yeah, for sure. Um, in fact, in my first PhD interview, which is actually at St Andrews, um, they put me up um, for the night um, in the bed and breakfast, which was lovely. I was having my um, Scottish breakfast, nice bit of haggis, nice bit of black pudding, all lovely, lovely, lovely. Um, and then my tooth fell out an, an hour before the interview. And uh, I didn't get it. Uh, so if you're preparing for an interview in the University of St Andrews, then um, 
Make sure you pack your Sensodyne. In all seriousness though, my interview style wasn't that great at that point. It really was a bit of a kick up the backside. So then when it came to my Bristol one, I was properly prepared. Now I don't want to go into detail about the interview questions because that really would take my jet lag to the absolute limit. Um, but I've put some um, potential questions um, in the description below this video. So have a browse through them. So these are ones which I got asked that I can remember. Um, just to give you an idea of what kind of things. The panel in these funding interviews won't necessarily even be people in your field. They won't even necessarily be biologists. Well, for me anyway, if you're applying for a biology PhD. The, their structure tends to be that you give a five minute presentation about some research that you've done. They then ask you questions on that presentation and then they'll move on to more general questions about um, why you want to do a PhD. Definitely have an answer for that sorted. Um, and just general questions about how you'd approach the PhD and why you've applied to that specific DTP. So definitely have a look on the old DTP website for what they can include. And then it's just a waiting game, I'm afraid. Have you got the funding or not? And generally, um, it's about one in three out of the people who get interviewed. So yeah, you've really got to have all fingers and toes crossed. <laughs> but then when you eventually find out, there are three potential outcomes. A, you've got the PhD, yay. B, you haven't got the PhD. Or C, you've been put on the reserve, oh God. <laughs> or three, you've been put on the reserve list. And that's actually what happened to me. Because, you see, now the situation is in the court of the students and normally the people who would have been first choice have got multiple offers for multiple other projects. So a lot of them will go for another project which means people on the reserve list move up. And that's actually what happened to me. I was, there were eight people um, chosen for my university and I was ninth on the list. So I had to wait, actually I didn't even have to wait that long, I was really lucky, I only needed to wait a couple of days before I was moved up the reserve list. And you know, you could be one of the lucky ones that gets multiple offers and then as I say, the ball's in completely your court and when it comes to deciding now then you've really got to weigh up a lot of things. You've got to, the, your main priority should be your interest in the project. I would say, which project do you find more interesting? Secondly, the supervisor. I think is really important. You've got to really weigh up how well you could work with this potential supervisor, how um, invested they are in you as a person. And you would have got that impression by speaking to them on Skype or you know even meeting them in person, that sort of thing. Doing this PhD, it is a mutual relationship between supervisor and student because it's, you know, at the end of the day, you're providing them with um, potential publications. So they should be as invested in you as you are in them because you're doing them a favor as well. And then my final point, if you do fail, look for directly funded projects. So DTPs aren't the only way to get funded PhDs in the UK. Sometimes if a lab group has a lot of money, they'll put a certain money, set of money stashed away for a specific PhD project. And there, the application process is a lot simpler because all you need to do is to apply for a project which already has the funding. So you don't have to go through this, you know, this obstacle course of applying for the project, then, you know, applying for the funding. And these projects are advertised throughout the year, not just in the autumn. So keep an eye out um, for them on findaphd.com throughout the year if you are unsuccessful in um, a DTP application. But yeah, luckily, and I mean luckily, that didn't happen to me. So I'm very much excited to start my PhD and I'm also looking forward to sharing it with you lot. In terms of moving forward with this channel, I think it would be really great to share some of my own research and my own scientific interests alongside the natural history stuff, um, which I th I'm already started to do. I really love this 
intersection between natural history and science and evolutionary biology and that sort of thing. So I'll definitely be keeping you updated um, with that. But in the meantime, thank you for watching this video. Nice to have the old whiteboard back. Of course, thank you for coming, Mr. Whiteboard. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And also, don't forget to subscribe. Ah, oh, you know what? My favourite colour in the whole world is the, the colour the subscribe button goes when you click it. Have you tried that? Or well, why do you... Why don't you try now? Go on, go on, just just click on it, you know? Um, yeah, you, it's a lovely colour. Oh, God, really thigh-rubbing stuff. Um, and yes, if you haven't already, don't forget to follow my at Benito Explains account. I'm uploading a lot of stuff on there recently about wildlife and science and evolutionary biology and that sort of thing. But for the moment, good luck in your PhD application process, young friends. I wish you well. I'm sure you'll do absolutely fantastic. Take these seven tips with you, and honestly, you can't go far wrong. See ya! Oh, God.